Today I'm going to teach you something that I learned recently that's just been kind of on my bucket list for a while. I'm a programmer and I work mostly with languages like uh, JavaScript, C Sharp, Python, and these languages um, are what you'd call like higher level languages, third generation languages. And I've always had it kind of on my bucket list to get down to the lower levels of the computer. You may think like, oh, you know, programmers know all the ins and outs of computers and stuff. And that may be true depending on what kind of computer programmer you are. But the kind that I am, we live actually many layers above the lowest layers of, this, of the computer. And there's a lot of what you might call magic going on uh, under all those layers to make all these amazing things happen. And so it kind of kind of makes me feel closer to my roots or whatever to, to understand what's happening at, uh, deeper down. So there's kind of two ways that I am abstracted away from the computer. One is that the computer speaks zeros and ones, basically, right? I'm, I'm simplifying here, but and when I write programs, um, I use words that are English like, you know, I use uh, control structures that are pretty high level. And uh, there's there's these layers in between that translate the words that I type into zeros and ones and a lot of zeros and ones I might add. Uh, and the other thing is that my code, when it executes, it runs inside a large ecosystem of other stuff. One of the key things in that ecosystem is the operating system, such as Windows or OS X. And a lot of the things my programs might do would be to ask the operating system to do something for me. It might be something pretty complicated, and it's great that I don't have to build that thing every time. Um, and that's great. That's what I should do. It makes me more productive in my daily work. But today we're going to do the total opposite. We're going to do what you do in school, right? And we're going to rebuild something for no reason other than just to learn. Uh, so we're going to write, we're going to take those layers completely away. We're going to write a program in zeros and ones, and there's going to be no other software running on the computer to help us. No operating system, nothing else. So to start, first thing we need is some way to write the zeros and ones. If you just open up a text editor and you try and write like a one and a zero, hey, look, we're writing a bunch of ones and zeros. Well, we're not really. We're actually writing text, right? Because text can be more than zeros and ones. It could be an A and it could be a G. And each of these letters has some binary value in zeros and ones that's actually a pretty big number. So we need an editor that lets us actually work with zeros and ones, kind of, except I'm already kind of lying. So here's what's called a, a hex editor, and it's about as close as we're going to bother to get to editing in zeros and ones. And here's, here's I just have to give you a quick little lesson on what hexadecimal, hex, hex is short for hexadecimal. And it allows us to type basically zeros and ones, but just in a way that's a little easier for us humans to read. So we're going to write in four bits at a time. A bit is a zero or a one, right? So let's say we want to do zero, 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 zero. That's like the lowest value that you can represent by four bits. That equals A. Zero, 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 one is a B. Zero, zero, one, zero is a C and so on, and it goes all the way up to F. One, 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 one equals F. So if I were to type F A, that means one, 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 zero, 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 except it's a lot easier to type and a lot faster to read. So that's what I can do up here. Um, the next thing I need to explain to you is uh, how, how do you even begin, right? Like, we're going to provide basically a blank disk, or nearly blank. We're just going to put the minimal amount of stuff on it to make it so that the computer can, can boot into that disk and start running the computer code that's on that disk. And when, when your computer boots up and you tell it, hey, look at my C drive, or whatever you might say is your where your operating system is. The first thing it's going to do 
is it's going to look at the first 512 bytes of data on that drive. And that's where this, this they call it like a boot sector. That's where this first code that kicks everything off must be found. And so that's what we're going to create. We need 512 bytes here. And we've actually got more than that right now. We've got a whole K here. So let's strip some of this away. Uh, delete that. We down to here. 608 bytes. Uh, I should have paid more attention. I need to take away what, like maybe that much. Perfect, that's 512 bytes. Okay, the next thing you need to know, well actually let's just start here. What if we just gave it this only? We're gonna save this out. We're gonna call it boot.bin. Just a binary file and this is gonna be, this is gonna represent our entire, like pretend this is the whole hard drive and that's all that's on the hard drive. I'm gonna go into my terminal here. You can see boot.bin, the file we just created and we're gonna execute it with a system called QMU. And uh, you know, it's, this is just uh, basically a program that simulates a whole computer. So this is going to be as if we put boot.bin on a computer disk, a CD or something and then put that CD into a fresh computer with nothing else on it. That's what QMU is going to do. It's going to simulate for that for us, make it a lot easier than having to physically do that while we're developing. So let's see what happens. I'm going to give it a minute. Basically, it's going to look through here and try to find something that it can boot, and it's going to fail. It's going to say no bootable device, right? Because we gave it a device it's just got a bunch of zeros on there. So there, there's something it's looking for on there to help it know if the device is actually bootable. And all it is actually is right at the end, this needs to be 55AA. And there's really no like important meaning there to tell you other than it's just a magic, it's just, it's just some arbitrary value that someone decided, hey, if it says 55AA there, then this drive claims to be bootable. So let's try that. We'll see what happens this time. I'm gonna replace that file, come back to our terminal, try and run it, and look, it attempts to boot from the hard disk. So it worked. Um, let's try to like do something. Like supposedly it worked, but we can't really see anything that we actually did. So let's type out some characters to the screen. Uh, so to do that, the first thing we need to do is turn on TTY mode, which is cheating a little bit. We're not leaning on an OS per se, but the, the CPU itself actually has some built-in logic in it called uh, the BIOS in this case. And the BIOS knows how to print letters out to the screen. And uh, we have, in order for that to work, we have to turn on TTY mode. So we do that by giving the CPU its first command. And that command is B40E. Now we have turned on TTY mode when it executes this. Now the next thing we need to do is there's there's a command to print something, to print a single letter to the screen. And it is CD10. Why did I skip a spot here? Well, because you can't tell CD what to print. Instead, what you do is you, you do this other command before, which is B0. B0 means to put some value in this in this thing that's called a register. Just think of it as like a, a bucket or a, a little piece of a place of memory where we can put data. And we're gonna put into that bucket some letter, right? 
and I'd love to put the letter H in there because what I'm going to do is type hello here. But there's no such thing as, uh, you can't just type letters in here. We have to do zeros and ones, right? And so there's this thing called ASCII where basically all it is is they assigned a number to every letter. And uh, the hexadecimal version of the number for the letter H is 48. So now we've put 48 into the bucket where things need to go to be printed. And then we say CD10, which means print the thing that's in that bucket. And let's continue. Let's, let's put some more things in there. So B0. And this time we're going to put the letter E in, which happens to be 65. And then let's do it again. B0. We're going to do L this time, which is 6C. Oh, whoops. I have been skipping a step here, right? Because CD10 is what tells it to actually print it, right? So we put in H, and then we said print it, and then we put in E, and then I forgot to tell it to print. So let's do that, CD10. Uh, so H, E, now we're going to do L. So again, uh, B0, and then the value of L is 6C, and then we need to print that, so CD10. And hello has two L's. And the value L is already in that bucket. So if we just do CD10 again, it'll print L again. And you can kind of see a preview of the stuff over here. It gives you some more human readable. You can see what uh, these letters are. Uh, some other things though, like this print command, it has, it, there's nothing sensical it can really print out for us there. So we've done our two L's, now we need an O. So let's do B0 again. And then we're going to put the letter O, which is 6F. And then we're going to print that out with CD10. And then finally, we're going to finish off with a special command called it's EB. EB means jump to some other spot, right? Like, because the CPU is, is going through line by line here, or byte by byte, and executing each of these commands. And EB means we want to jump back somewhere. We could tell it to like jump back here, or jump back here, and reprint these things. And I'm actually going to tell it a special thing, FE. FE means jump to here, like right where my arrow is, which is right where this command is. So it's just going to keep looping. It's, it's going to jump back to the jump command that tells it to jump back to the jump command. As you can see, we're just doing an infinite loop. So basically, I'm telling it, hey, when you're done printing these characters, just sit idle. Well, I guess it's technically not idle, but it's just going to sit there and loop, and you won't see anything happening. And that's the end of our program. That should print hello and be done. Let's see if I made any typos, because, you know, when you're typing zeros and ones or hex, it's pretty easy to make a mistake. But hopefully we get lucky and this will all work. Oh my goodness, it worked. First try. Sweet! Let's try one last thing. I haven't actually tried this before, but in theory, uh, it should work to jump right back here to this location in memory. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, I, I, I'm not actually prepared to do that for this video, so let's just end there. But that uh, that's the beginning. That's how you write some code that runs directly on your CPO with no other help. Congratulations. Now you know how to do it, if you made it through this video. <laughs> the end.